Good evening, everyone. We are the Silicon Valley ACM SIGGRAPH. And every month we try to present uh, technology subjects to all of you that are related to computer graphics. Tonight, we will be showing you how to predict high frequency signals via low frequency embeddings. We have a Stanford Research Fellow here, Jane Wu, who would be taking us through this uh, journey. But before that, let me tell you about our chapter. So the Silicon Valley ACM SIGGRAPH was founded in 1984 to promote the knowledge of computer graphics and interactive techniques. We have upcoming events and meetup, and you're more than welcome to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We also have monthly meetings, and they're usually focused on technology topics, which includes visual effects, VR, AR, animation, hardware, art, history, and more. We also do joint events with other chapters. So now we'll let Jane give the floor to you. Sure. Thanks, Elise. As Elise mentioned, my name is Jane. I'm currently a PhD student at Stanford. And the title of my talk is Learning to Predict High Frequency Signals via Low Frequency Embeddings. In particular, I'll be highlighting two recent papers that I've worked on. Um, so I've never met any of you before, so here's a little introduction about myself. My advisor is Ron Fedko, and my research is at the intersection of graphics and computer vision. In particular, I've been focusing on learning the 3D geometry and dynamics of deformable objects, in particular clothing worn on the human body. This is a very challenging problem because cloth has many complex folds and wrinkles, and so many standard machine learning methods currently uh, do not perform very well for these highly complex uh, objects. And so to approach this problem, I've been exploring a general paradigm of embedding high frequency details, uh, specifically cloth wrinkles and folds in low frequency embedding spaces. And so during this talk, I will be discussing two such embeddings that I use. And uh, using this kind of framework, I've demonstrated that neural networks can better infer high frequency details uh, just from this change in representation of the data. So here's an outline of my talk. Uh, I'll start with the motivation and background and then dive into two recent papers. The first one of which was presented at SCA this past September. Um, the first one is on an idea called texture sliding, which uses a material space 2D embedding to encode 3D geometry. And the second one is called a skinned tetrahedral mesh framework, which embeds clothing in a volumetric tetrahedral mesh surrounding the person's body. And then finally, I'll discuss some future directions that I'm currently working on in my lab. So to motivate this specific problem, uh, why do we care about capturing cloth geometry? Well, I think there are a number of very straightforward applications such as virtual try-on or VR AR applications where you have some real world images or video of people and you want to be able to understand the geometry of the person as well as the clothing that they're wearing. Um, for virtual try-on, the application is uh, very direct in that maybe you want to retarget some uh, clothing that you are selling to this person's body so that they can see what they look like in a realistic manner. And then you can go beyond that in terms of applications like uh, Metaverse, Omniverse, where you want to create a digital avatar for that person. And so having realistic clothing is so important to creating a realistic looking virtual avatar. So here you can see uh, this is kind of a sub problem that I've been working on, which is given joint angles for a specific person, so we know what the skeleton is, uh, we want to infer the cloth geometry for that given pose. And so, of course, as the person moves around, the wrinkles and folds that appear on their clothing changes. And so we've been exploring uh, deep learning based methods for inferring this geometry from pose. Uh, 
So uh, the first paper that I'll be talking about is texture sliding. Um, but before that, the motivation for that paper was that current neural networks often predict overly smooth clothing. So on the left, you see the ground truth cloth that we have had generated data for. And then on the right, you see the network inference. So in particular, there are a lot of key wrinkles that are missing from the inferred cloth uh, that are actually present in the ground truth. And so, as you can see, the right is much less, I mean, it matches the, the real uh, material properties of the clothing, uh, not particularly well. And I guess there are a number of reasons for why neural networks uh, are inherently uh, maybe not ideal for predicting high frequency features, or at least existing, many existing neural networks. One of these reasons is regularization, which seeks to, you know, produce overly smooth, not overly smooth, but just smooth out your model parameters. And so this often results in predictions that are also relatively smooth, but that's not what we want in our specific case. And so this is the name of the paper, Recovering Geometric Information from Learned Texture Perturbations. So now after motivating that problem, uh, I've talked about texture sliding, but what is it exactly? So we define texture sliding as the changing of texture coordinates on our cloth geometry on a per camera basis, such that any point which is visible from a stereo pair of cameras can be triangulated back to its ground truth position. So what does this mean? This means that when we're viewing cloth geometry from a given camera, we want the geometry to look like the ground truth from that particular view. So in a general sense, it's essentially faking the wrinkles on the geometry using texture rather than 3D perturbation directly. So in this image, you can see on the left, the inferred cloth, which is textured with uh, the blue pattern. And then the orange pattern is showing the ground truth texture. And then on the right, you can see the result of texture sliding. So what we do is we change the texture coordinates such that the appearance of the cloth matches the ground truth. And so, of course, if you're looking at the clothing from a given view, you have a set of 2D displacements, but that will change given different camera views. Um, so here is a concrete example that maybe is, is better for visualization. So this is the inferred cloth, meaning the output from uh, an existing deep neural network. And then this is the result of texture sliding for this given camera view. And this is the ground truth. So if I toggle back, you can see that the network output and the inferred and the texture sliding result are quite different. So particularly in the center of the clothing here, you can see that the wrinkles are changing. But note that this change is not due to geometry, it's actually due to changing the texture coordinates. And now if I toggle between the ground truth and the texture sliding result, you can see that besides the uh, silhouette boundaries, the wrinkles are actually matching up between the ground truth and this texture sliding output. And so this is what we want to uh, generate data for and train a network to learn is how to generate these 2D displacements uh, such that if we have a, an existing network and it produces overly smooth results, how can we apply this post process to actually recover the real wrinkles um, in, in this lower frequency space, which is the material or texture space. So this is the goal for texture sliding, but there are a number of considerations when we are actually implementing this method. Um, the first is that there are, per, we discretize this process using uh, cloth vertices, which means we can have errors caused by barycentric interpolation, which is a linear interpolation method. So in this diagram, you can see uh, an extreme case where let's say the cloth mesh has this red triangle that is very large and covers a large area. Now, when we uh, look at the pattern space for this triangle, if we very centrically interpolate, then we are interpolating along this green triangle drawn on the right. Uh, 
However, the true texture of this area um, can be something like the yellow region, which is highly nonlinear. And so we introduce some amount of air due to a per vertex discretization. Um, so one way to combat that is if, you know, of course, this is an extreme case. If you subdivide your mesh, then you will reduce the air in this uh, assumption. And then the second consideration is that, as I mentioned before, the occlusion boundaries differ between the network output on the left and the ground truth on the right. And so these are areas that need extra consideration when generating the training data. Um, so now going into what data do we actually use? Uh, we use a simulated t-shirt data set from uh, a paper from SCA 2020. So these are a collection of t-shirt meshes corresponding to a particular body. So the body was scanned and then the t-shirt was cut by the seams and then also scanned and then uh, physically simulated on the body. So this data set consists of 10,000 different poses that are split into 80%, 10%, 10% for the training validation and test sets for our machine learning model. And so here you can see uh, three examples for uh, the training data set. So these are different poses for the same t-shirt. So now uh, concretely to generate the texture sliding data, what we do is we train a network for a given camera view. So we have a camera and we can cast a ray from the camera aperture to each of the inferred mesh vertices. And so from here on out, I'll be referring to the network prediction as the inferred mesh. So we cast these rays going from the camera to each of the mesh vertices on the cloth. And we determine the first intersection point with the ground truth mesh. So this is essentially determining what the camera is seeing for that given uh, ray. And we want to copy the texture coordinates from the ground truth mesh to the inferred mesh. So we do that using barycentric interpolation. Um, and as I mentioned before, because of this uh, discretization, we have some amount of errors uh, after we apply texture sliding. And so here on the left, you can see the texture coordinate errors for the inferred cloth originally. And then on the right, you can see the result of using texture sliding. And so the error is significantly reduced after applying texture sliding. And uh, the square root mean squared error we report here is computed by casting rays from the camera aperture again, but looking at for every pixel, what is the difference in texture coordinates between the ground truth and either the inferred cloth or the result of texture sliding. And finally, we train a deep neural network to be able to automatically predict what the texture space offsets should be given a specific pose. And so what we do is we pass in the joint angles corresponding to that pose from the skeleton. And then what we output from the neural network are two offset images, one for the front and one for the back of the t-shirt. So this is telling us for each vertex in the cloth mesh, what is the UV displacement that we should apply uh, to the texture coordinates. And then we train this model on the training data set I mentioned before and an L2 loss. So here you can see some of the results of texture sliding. Um, I think maybe the most concrete number here is again the square root mean squared error on the right. So you can see that by using this texture sliding post process, we can significantly reduce the error from the original neural network and thereby uh, move the output closer to the ground truth. And you can see the errors are often near the silhouette boundary and near uh, areas of the arm. And there are a number of applications of texture sliding beyond just what I've described, which is being able to, uh, to improve the appearance of the cloth from a given view. So one of the applications is that we can actually interpolate between the results of texture sliding from say a finite number of views to a variety of different uh, views 
with uh, kind of between the, the predictions. So even though we need to train a separate neural network for every camera view, we only need a small number of camera views to be able to actually kind of uh, encompass the space of views that we're interested in. So here I'm showing uh, texture sliding neural network results for two views, one on the far left, one on the far right. And the uh, results in between are linearly interpolated between the left and the right. Um, so this is all good and fine, but here is a better visualization. So in this particular video, we have uh, four cameras placed uh, on the corners of the uh, area here. So two on the top, two on the bottom. And those are uh, computed using texture sliding from the given views. And then we use bilinear interpolation to generate the uh, texture coordinates for the all the views in between. And so here on the left, I'm showing the result of texture sliding. And on the right, I'm showing the ground truth. So on the left, the actual geometry is the inferred cloth, so the, the smooth results. However, if you look at uh, this video now, on the right, what I'm doing is fixing the camera view so that you can see how the texture coordinates are changing. So uh, on the left, you can see that the textures on the cloth mesh look relatively static because we are changing the camera view. But once you fix the camera view, you can see that actually the texture coordinates are uh, changing quite dramatically to fit the ground truth mesh at those views. And finally, um, kind of the, the biggest takeaway from our method is that we can actually reconstruct the 3D geometry in the end using these 2D texture sliding displacements. Um, and the way we do that in the paper is that we have these TSNN texture sliding neural network results for at least two camera views. We use four in our reconstruction. And what we can do is construct rays that pass through the camera aperture and the ground truth texture coordinates for each of the inferred mesh vertices. So what we're doing is we know what the 2D displacements from texture sliding are for given camera views. But then we can triangulate between those views to turn those 2D displacements into 3D displacements for the cloth vertices. And so in the end, from these sparse numbers of views, we can actually reconstruct the true geometry of the clothing. And so here you can see for one pose, on the left is the ground truth mesh, in the middle is the inferred cloth, and then on the right is the output of our entire texture sliding uh, pose process. And so you can see that there's a big difference between the wrinkles uh, in the middle and the wrinkles on the right, which much cl more closely match the uh, ground truth. And here you can see Again, the, the same pose and the same reconstructed geometry on the right from a, a variety of camera views. And then here are also three more examples. So you can see for these variety of poses, uh, our method is able to recover the true wrinkling pattern of the shirt much better than previously. Um, I think another artifact that we avoid is being able to see the underlying body. So in particular, in this middle row, uh, for some of the poses, you can see something like a belly button for the results, which is something that we definitely don't want, especially for a uh, virtual trial. So in summary, there were a number of takeaways from this paper that I think are kind of generalizable beyond the actual experiments that we ran. So the first is that the goal of the paper was to study how to use neural networks to model the actual material behavior of the clothing, meaning friction, material parameters, et cetera. Um, and this is difficult for a neural network to do if you're just training something that's very vanilla, that doesn't have any kind of uh, prior knowledge or uh, kind of embedding space uh, information about the data that you are trying to infer something from. And so what we demonstrated is that because we know something about 
texture coordinates in terms of just graphics, uh, we are able to encode these high frequency wrinkles that are present in 3D in this lower frequency texture coordinate space. And as a result, we are able to uh, better predict these high frequency features than say just the, the default neural network that had been used before. Furthermore, we also demonstrated that this can be used beyond just what the network is trained to do. So we show that the TSNN results uh, from a few camera views can be used for novel view interpolation and then also for 3D reconstruction. Um, so this is something that can be used as a post-process for any existing neural network. Now, the second paper is uh, a follow-up work to what I just talked about. It's uh, called Skinning a Parameterization of Three-Dimensional Space for Neural Network Clock. So in this paper, we explore a slightly different embedding space, but it is one where we're actually able to decouple low and high frequency components of our data. Uh, data in this case referring to the cloth geometry. So the first thing I'll talk about is what embedding space we are using. Uh, we're using something called a kinematically deformed skin mesh or KDSM. And this is something that our lab had developed earlier for actually hair simulation. And what they demonstrated is that it's much more efficient to embed hair uh, follicles or, or kind of hair particles in a tetrahedral volume metric mesh rather than thinking about each of the hairs individually. And so you can deform the tetrahedral mesh as say a person or an animal is moving around and just compute that deformation rather than trying to deform each of the particles individually. And so we apply this idea now to clothing where we can form a volumetric mesh around a person's body and then we can uh, extrapolate skinning weights for that tetrahedral mesh from the person so that this volume can deform as the person is moving. And so here on the far right, you can see that this tetrahedral mesh can follow the person uh, as the pose changes. So why is this nice? Well, it means that we can embed cloth in this volume such that this volumetric embedding space is deformed uh, as deformed with respect to the person's pose. And so to do this, uh, we have the same cloth mesh and we compute barycentric weights for each of the T-pose cloth mesh vertices in this tetrahedral volume. And so that means, uh, naively speaking, if we have a new pose theta, then we can transform the cloth vertices rigidly using uh, this fixed embedding and just essentially applying linear blend skinning to the cloth mesh. However, as you can see, uh, this leads to artifacts that aren't actually truthful to the data in that if we just use the T-pose cloth mesh embedding, we do not take into account the elastic deformation of the cloth as the person moves around. So of course, as you move, the actual wrinkles and folds that you see change. So to account for these uh, pose-dependent displacements, we compute the difference between this material space embedding, which we call UI naught, and the actual pose, uh, the, pose uh, the cloth corresponding to the pose, which is UI of theta on the right. And so we end up with these displacements DI of theta, which are in 3D space, so XYZ displacements. So now we have these 3D displacements um, for the given pose. But what we're interested in is to compute the plastic deformation of the cloth in material space. Uh, so using the T-pose KDSM or the T-pose volume. So here, what you can see is in the first row, we have the UI of thetas, which are the ground truth cloth meshes in that pose. And then on the bottom, what we have is UIM of theta, which is deforming the uh, elastic deformation of the cloth in the actual material space. So here you can see kind of the, the same wrinkles you see in the first row, but actually in this uh, T-pose embedding. So the, an important consideration here is uh, what we want the neural network to learn 
is that we want to learn uh, deformation in the T pose rather than in these given uh, theta poses so that we can decouple the rigid skinning with the non-rigid deformation of the wrinkles. So the way we do that is we have these di of thetas that we computed in the pose, but we want to know what those corresponding displacements should be in material space. And now this is actually a non-trivial task because when we pose the tetrahedral volume, there are often a lot of inverted elements as well as overlapping tetrahedra, particularly near the arm areas. And if we had considered the full body near the legs. And so what this means is, if you look at an area like the armpit, there might be for a given cloth mesh, multiple parent tetrahedra that we could embed that vertex in. Um, so the question is, how do we robustly compute cloth vertex embeddings. And so this is one of the main challenges of the paper. And there are a number of uh, methods that we could use. So the first most basic method is to make a list of all the parent tetrahedra that a given cloth vertex uh, is inside, and then simply randomly choose one or maybe take the first one. So here you can see that there are often a lot of uh, undesirable artifacts that we get if we just randomly choose some parent tetrahedra. Uh, a, a specific example is that maybe we have a, a vertex of the cloth that should be on the body, uh, on the torso of the person, but it's actually embedded in the arm, uh, in an arm tetrahedron in the volumetric mesh. That means when we skin the KDSM, then this vertex will be skinned with respect to the arm, which is not what we want because we want it to stay near the torso. And so we end up with these artifacts often near the armpits and uh, they can often be skinned too far out uh, from this actual cloth mesh. And so, you know, one might argue, well, if we unskin the cloth back to the original, or I guess skin the, the cloth back to the pose, then we still end up with the correct ground truth mesh here in the middle. However, if we're training a neural network to learn displacements, then that means that there is a very high variance in the ground truth displacements that you're asking the neural network to learn. And so this can result in sort of ringing artifacts in the network inference. So on the far right, you can see an example of a neural network trained on this data, which we had initially tried, uh, but that did not result in very accurate predictions. So an alternative approach is to compute uh, UV normal offsets from the actual body mesh in the given pose theta, and then use the same offsets in material space. So when we unpose the body. Um, now here, there are also some errors because uh, you can compute UV normal offsets from the body surface, but then that coordinate space deforms when you unpose the person. And so we also end up with some amount of error in our displacements here. And so uh, while in the first method, we are actually recovering the ground truth cloth when we return to the pose theta, in the second case, we still get some small amount of error because rather than uh, computing the exact displacements, we are using the UV normals instead of the, the KDSM to compute these offsets. And so in the end, we came up with a hybrid method that uses both of uh, the algorithms we had, I had described. And so what we do is we look at the first method, which is generating a list of parent tetrahedra, and we compare it to the second method, which is UVN offsets. And the ones that are close to each other, we can just accept given a specific threshold. And then we run a Poisson morph to extrapolate those results to the rest of the cloth mesh. And then because the Poisson morph also introduces some new errors, then we again compare to uh, method two, and then we uh, define more of the cloth vertices that correspond with the second method, and then we repeat. And so in the end, we end up with uh, uh, displacements for every single cloth mesh. So then once we have this clean data, uh, we can train a neural network that has is looking at uh, data that is accurate and has low variance. 
And so we train a similar network that I had described before in that we take in the pose and output the cloth images. But in this case, the values of those cloth images correspond to these uh, material space deformations in the KDSM rather than the texture sliding UV displacements I had described before. And so just to jump to the results, what we see is that our method is able to, again, do much better than an existing network. Um, and comparing this to texture sliding, uh, not only do we recover wrinkles better, but we also kind of recover the overall volume of the clothing much better than uh, a previous work did, where they use UV and displacements rather than uh, tetrahedral mesh displacements. And so on the bottom, you can again see some artifacts. And uh, on the right here, you can see some quantitative numbers. So we were able to cut the average vertex error by half. Uh, and you can see on the top there, it's a histogram of the errors from all the examples in the test set. And so you can see that uh, on not only on average is the error lower, but also for every single example in the test set, uh, the majority of them are also much lower than a previous method. And then finally, uh, we also tested our method on a mocap sequence. So here we took some data from uh, a CMU robotics mocap data set, and we simply ran network inference. So on the left, you can see a previous result, and the, on the right is ours. And so again, you can see the, the belly button artifact up here again. And then furthermore, we also compared to one of uh, another state-of-the-art cloth shape estimation papers uh, called TaylorNet. So in their case, they based their method off of this simple model, SMPL, um, which is some PCA-based model for capturing human uh, shape. And we can also see that the, the result looks much more realistic. And then the last thing is, again, we were able to kind of uh, apply our method beyond the task that we were training the network on. So what we did was we were able to um, modify the body shape of the person, but uh, transfer the cloth deformations that we were predicting from our given neural network. So our neural network was trained on a particular body and a particular article of clothing. But here, what we do is we transform that body to, we transform the KDSM to the simple body here, so a different person. And then we also transform the T-pose t-shirt so that it fits the T-pose person. But then we can keep the same displacements that we computed from the network. And we can see that we get different wrinkling patterns using the same material space deformation on these different uh, bodies. So here from uh, left to right, you can see the different bodies. And then looking at the columns, uh, these are different poses, or I guess the different rows are different poses, yeah. And so this is kind of a, a nice result that we were able to get um, without initially kind of planning to account for this. And then furthermore, we can also change the uh, size of the t-shirt. And on the same body, you can still get uh, a difference in the wrinkling pattern, which is also kind of a nice result that we got. So again, in summary, in this particular case, we explored a volumetric parameterization of cloth uh, that outperforms simply computing offsets from the body surface. And so, uh, you know, if you consider cloth deformation in terms of the body, then when you actually skin the body, you can have a high variation in where the cloth is moving. So if the cloth was here in the pose, then if you skin the body, then there can be a large change in where the cloth is moving. However, if we use this kind of tetrahedral volume, then uh, we can kind of ensure that the cloth deformation is contained within the tetrahedra, uh, the corresponding parent tetrahedra. And uh, this idea was in part kind of uh, inspired by continuum mechanics where oftentimes one will decompose elastic and plastic deformation 
And in our case, we were able to show that this decomposition results in more accurate predictions of these high frequency components that we we're interested in, namely the wrinkles and folds. And uh, finally, there's been an increasing body of work on implicit representations for uh, body and clothing. So some recent papers are Tetra TSDF, PIFO HD, et cetera. Um, and the nice thing about using a volumetric mesh like a KDSM is that we can also compute things like sine distance functions within this volume um, that can result in a kind of lower dimensional network output and also uh, allows the neural network to compute continuous functions such as SDFs rather than kind of a discretized vertex positions, et cetera. So this is uh, an exciting area that we've been exploring recently. And along those lines, uh, I'm also working on a number of future directions based on these two papers. The first one is to expand this work to full cloth capture, meaning we are taking as input images or videos of a person, and we want to accurately reconstruct the clothing on their body. Um, and so, you know, there are a number of works that do this currently, but we're interested in kind of the, the high quality setting where we actually care about recovering the real wrinkles and folds. And so to do this, we're leveraging both the texture sliding and the cloth KDSM papers that I've discussed. And as I was alluding to earlier, um, we've also been thinking about how to uh, implicitly predict the surface of clothing or the surface of the person using volumetric 3D parameterization such as the KDSM. And so this work has a number of applications, most directly to kind of AR, VR in the context of clothing uh, for robotics, such as kind of being able to accurately compute collisions using a volumetric representation. And then finally in physical simulation. So um, some of my other lab mates have worked on using the methods that I've discussed to accelerate kind of cloth simulation methods and be able to generate more realistic results efficiently. Uh, so with that, thank you so much for listening to my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions or if I kind of uh, sped through any of the concepts. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jane. Yeah. Do we have any questions for Jane? Or I can start. So, so Jane, you know, the methods that you discussed, which extended, could that be extended to different clothing types? such as the pants and coats, and how do we extend that? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so this is something that we've you know, explored after these two papers. And we found that if we can separate the body into different parts and kind of generate a separate volumetric mesh, this is specifically referring to the KDSM, if we can kind of, uh, discretize the body into different parts and have a different volumetric mesh, then we can avoid dealing with artifacts near the armpits or, or near the legs um, and be able to kind of directly apply the method that I discussed for a t-shirt to the entire body. So uh, we've, we've been able to kind of make a direct jump to different articles of clothing, even uh, kind of more loose fitting coats and uh, dresses. You may unmute yourself so you can just, um, we can just all ask random questions to Jane. What can you say about uh, temporal stability? Uh, your videos look pretty good, but they may well have been uh, well chosen. I can, <laughs> I, can just, I can just imagine there might be some, some artifacts and how would you uh, propose to, uh, to work through them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I will say that I think the networks just tend to predict smooth results. So in, in this video, yeah, I guess we, there are some artifacts, it's not too bad. I would say in the texture sliding paper, we did see more uh, temporal artifacts. And uh, I think number one, if we get more accurate network results, then they tend to be more smooth. And also uh, our lab recently just released a paper on archive that thinks about using kind of a, a dynamics post-process to uh, kind of ensure that the dynamics between frames makes sense in the context of maybe using springs. So 
like if you define some kind of force between adjacent frames, you want the change between those frames to behave in some smooth manner. Um, so that's been something that has helped increase the temporal coherence. Yeah. So I have another question, Jane. You know, the DNN yeah. that you used in your texture sliding paper, is, yeah. it's trained for camera view. Yeah. How would that method scale to practical application? Yeah. Um, so one thing that we thought about when we were writing the paper was that we actually only need two camera views for a VR setting. So if we have a VR headset, we have two views, one for each of the eyes. Um, and if we can recover what the geometry should look like for the scene, you know, beyond just clothing, but any, any objects, if we can recover that appearance for two views, then our eyes will naturally do the triangulation between those views. And so I would say, practically speaking, having to do this per camera inference isn't a huge issue um, for a, maybe a, a variety of applications. Yeah. yeah, and now with our cloth capture work, uh, again, since we are capturing the person in a given camera view, then we actually, you know, what we care about is the given view. Or if we have, say, an array with three cameras or more. Thank you. Yeah. You I may know. also type your your questions in the chat if you, you don't want to unmute yourselves. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I had a question about the um, the volumetric representation um, of cloth. It surprised me because cloth is this thing that folds up on itself and wrinkles are, and I, I can just imagine, I think you mentioned it, like the volume that has to hold that would also not only collapse on the surface, but it has to now extend and be, have some thickness. So like how did, how did, Am I am I understanding it right? The way you're using this volume is to is to actually hold a surface and the volume distorts, or is it more like is there something else happening there where it's just it's just a displacement holding the surface? Yeah, so um, we aren't running a simulation in the sense where like you know the the volume is trying to hold the clothing. Um, so so that's something that we kind of don't need to consider. What we do is we use the volume as a parameterization of 3D space. So what we're saying is uh, the cloth geometry changes as this volume uh, is skinned or rigidly transformed based on the person's body. So like uh, what we do is the, the volume is essentially carrying the clothing with it because we very centrically embed every vertex in some tetrahedron. So let's say this vertex is here. So then we can skin the uh, tet mesh. And then, you know, if we fix the embedding, then the cloth naturally moves with the volume because we are uh, constraining the association between the cloth and the volume. So, yeah, I'm not. So, so it's really kind of just a means of, of yeah. skinning the cloth to the torso or? Yeah, so that's that's the first step. So we can skin, right? So we can use the tet mesh to skin the cloth, but then as you can see, if we only apply skinning, then we don't recover kind of the, the ground truth wrinkling pattern of the clothing since we're only using a, a rigid transformation. So then the, that's where we are computing these displacements from the uh, material space, as we call it, embedding. So it's uh, essentially a, a very concrete way of separating, OK, what are the displacements caused by skinning versus what are the displacements caused by the you know, elastic deformation of the clothing, given the change in pose. Is the embedding, or sorry, is are the results precise enough to uh, uh, account for collisions? Uh, so the 
ground truth data was run using uh, quasi-static simulations. So yeah, in the simulation, we account for collisions and kind of penetrations in the clothing. And yeah. So I guess because our the data set we use for this machine learning model, it was generated with a sim. So we are accounting for those uh, artifacts. Yeah. Thanks. I had a question about the coverage of the data set. I, you're kind of limited to that in a way, but how do you know you really captured the, the whole space well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, when we generated the data set, we used a, kind of a, a paper on what is the range of motion for uh, the average person? And then we randomly sampled that space. So I guess let me find, the, yeah, this one. So um, I guess, yeah, with 10,000 poses, we cover essentially the, the entire range of the you know, feasible human motion, I would say. Um, but I think, I, I think what you're asking also kind of points to just generalization um, as a whole. So I, I did show the mocap video, but I think uh, it's interesting that we can extend the KDSM work to different body shapes and also clothing sizes without having to retrain a different network. Um, and then beyond to kind of different garments and things like that, I think there you really need more training data because you know, if, if some machine learning model has never seen pants or it hasn't seen a dress, then it is very hard to um, kind of a lot, like to train a model that can generalize to that kind of extreme unseen case. Um, so I guess that's a very much an active research area where people are both trying to collect more data and also trying to develop methods that can generalize better. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, um, you, men you mentioned a number of different processes. There's the deep learning networks, there's the Poisson interpolation, there's the texture sliding. How much of it is, uh, is done in the neural network? And, uh, and you know, what sort of performance uh, can you get or can you expect to get? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the kind of the neural network part is we already have our kind of for the texture sliding case, for example, we already have these ground truth correspondences between, okay, we have a given pose, what should the texture sliding be for that pose? Um, so we train a neural network in a supervised manner such that we want to minimize the difference between what the network is predicting and what we had computed. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so that's the learning part. And I would say that in general, the network performs pretty well on the training data set, what it's optimized for. And then the inference errors is always going to be some amount higher. Um, but we were able to kind of approve upon the previous state of the art um, where we can better predict the wrinkles. So. So yeah, that that's the. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, so are you saying that everything has been incorporated into the neural network, or I thought there was some post processing as well? Oh yeah, so the post process or this texture sliding, we train a neural network to learn. So so mm -hmm. essentially we want to substitute our procedural post-process with, with a neural network. Um, and the reason for that is we, I guess, yeah, as I mentioned earlier to uh, Carl's question, I, we have a training data set with, you know, like 8,000 8, poses. So we, we do not have a kind of like every single possible pose for this person. And so we, what we want the network to be able to do is take this finite data set and be able to generalize to any pose. Mm -hmm. So uh, after we train the model, we can say, okay, well, we have this new pose we haven't seen before. Um, what should the texture sliding be? So that's um, kind of the, the end result of training the learning model is that we can uh, 
kind of extrapolate beyond what the network has seen. Okay, and and what sort of uh, um, I don't know what I want to call it frame rate or uh, latency yeah. is there um, currently? I know I know this is a research phase, so <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's an important question, actually. So Ron and a lot of my lab mates are at Epic Games, and they're mm -hmm. you know they they do care about the frame rate, right, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I think that has all been implemented and uh, because neural networks generally run pretty efficiently uh, mm -hmm. on the GPU, I think they didn't have a big latency issue for, for both of these uh, methods. Mm. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Just wanted to thank Jane for a presentation for our chapter and for all of us tonight for your time too. All right, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Stay tuned for our upcoming presentation. We'll be posting it on Meetup. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>